Hello, good morning. My name is Adam Warski. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Software Mill. And today I would like to talk briefly about Project Loom, what it is, and how it might fit into the landscape of concurrent programming as we know it today. So first, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? Well, we would like to create a large number of processes in a cheap way. And these, process of, uh, these processes, of course, should run concurrently. Uh, this might be for two reasons why we want to create a large number of these processes. It might be a business requirement, or it might simply be the case that the problem that we have is best modeled using a large number of small concurrently or potentially concurrently running tasks. So some concrete examples of what, that's, of what uh, such problems might be, might be in practice. So we might have a large number of HTTP requests to process concurrently. We might have a lot of messages on a messaging queue to process. We might need to maybe integrate with some external services or orchestrate some workflows. Maybe we have some background jobs to run. So these are some of the examples that you might have uh, in mind while we talk about Project Loom. So what is the current situation? We are on the JVM, so we have to accept the limits and the constraints that the JVM gives us. And currently the basic unit of concurrency in Java and on the JVM is a thread. Uh, as a Java thread maps one to one to a, to a kernel thread. And these threads, they work well, but they have their limitations. So they are expensive to create. They are expensive to switch. So it's, it takes a lot of time to switch from one thread of execution to another. And we can only create a limited number of them. And we are limited here by stack memory. So the current solutions uh, to this problem is to create uh, a thread of pools. So we create this thread of pools up front. So we pay the cost of creation only once. We still have the problems of switching and concurrency. So that's why people came up with, uh, an, uh, with another abstraction on top of thread pools, which are futures uh, or promises or completable futures as we know them in Java. And the future uh, is a value, which is very important which represents a computation running in the background. And that computation might eventually complete with some value here with type T, or it might end with an error. And these features, they are very cheap to create, they are cheap to switch. There is um, a scheduler which assigns which features should run on which, uh, on which threads, and there's a thread pool in the background as well. Um, and the, we can create a virtually an unlimited number of uh, futures. Um, so, um, many modern uh, libraries and frameworks for Java and other JVM languages are now future-based or some, uh, some flavor of future. But this also means that, well, in a way, life used to be simple, right? Here we have some simple sequential code which activates a user in the, in the database, right? We have a blocking call. Uh, database.findUser, which does some I/O operations, and then we activate the user if 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 the, if the user is found. Now, if you transform that code into a future-based version, which will be much more performant, we won't be blocking any kernel threads. We will be we will be doing only asynchronous operations, uh, and um, yeah, this code will be much faster. But it also will not look as good, right? Here we have the versions with futures. The control flow isn't that uh, clearly visible. The futures are viral, meaning that now our uh, top-level method needs to return a future as well, only because database.findUser and database.activateUser return futures. Um, and also, the, if there are any exceptions that happen here, the stack traces won't be that nice. So these are three problems that we face each day we work with futures, and maybe it will be nice to solve them. And that's where Pro Project Loom comes in. So Project Loom aims to drastically reduce the effort of writing, maintaining, and observing high throughput concurrent applications that make the best use of available hardware. That's the mission from, from their website. What does it mean in practice? Well, the major contribution, the first major contribution of, pro of uh, Project Loom are virtual threads. A virtual thread is just like a thread. Uh, it has the same interface uh, in Java. We still work with thread instances, but it is cheap to create and block. It is created in a slightly different way. We still pass in a chunk of code that should be run in the virtual thread. You can see that there's a different method. It behaves like a thread, but it's not mapped directly to a kernel thread. 
Um, so in other languages we have similar concepts known as fibers, coroutines, uh, green threads and so on. So it's not a, a new concept in the programming world but it is new to Java. And it is not that different from futures. With futures we had a large number of, uh, of processes which were scheduled to run on a, limited, uh, on a limited thread pool by a scheduler. Here we have the same, we have a large number of, vir of virtual threads which are scheduled by a scheduler which is built into uh, Java and the JVM to run on a limited thread pool. The difference is that uh, while with futures, uh, futures were a library construct and here we have something that's baked into the, uh, that's baked into J the JVM. Uh, so the second major contribution of Loom is retrofitting. Retrofitting existing uh, kernel thread blocking operations so that they become non-blocking or rather that they uh, block virtual threads. So each time we have an input stream and we call, uh, we call the read method, we call the write method on the writer, we acquire a semaphore or even when we sleep on a thread. So each time we do that we don't actually block the underlying kernel thread, but instead we block uh, the virtual thread on which we are currently running. So um, Project Loom started in 2017 uh, as an exploratory or uh, research project. Um, there have been a couple of iterations to how solve the problems that we've been talking about. Currently you can uh, download early access uh, JVM builds which have Project Loom uh, built in. It's still subject to change. Uh, I'm not aware of any specific dates or any specific JDK versions which will include which will include Pro Project Loom. So, well, you have to watch uh, watch the news and see when it when it's finally included in the official builds. So. We saw problems with sequential code and using Project Loom, well, with sequential code uh, which uh, was um, uh, which uh, overused futures, let's say, uh, and this is now solved using uh, using Project Loom. We can go back to the old days. So, are all of our problems solved? Well, unfortunately, not all of them. Right? We still have to keep in mind that a virtual thread is still a thread, and Threads come with a set of problems, right? If we have concurrently running thread, we have to communicate between them. We have to orchestrate them, so we have to specify when one thread stops, uh, when another thread starts, how how they interoperate. We have to work with interruptions. So, what happens when a thread is no longer needed? We need to tell it to to stop doing the work, right? So, there's a lot of problems when when dealing with threads, and we can use low-level primitives uh, to actually uh, solve this, uh, these uh, tasks, right? We can use semaphores, we can use locks, we can use queues or channels uh, and well these work well but these are quite low-level and people have found again and again that they are quite error-prone. So we probably don't want to use them um, in, a, in, in our applications. Instead, these are great tools for libraries to, to use to implement uh, to implement some high-level abstractions that, that we might use to write concurrently running uh, programs. So ag again, let's reiterate why would we want to use Loom. Loom gives us great tools to write uh, non-blocking code in the blocking style and it retrofits the blocking APIs into non-blocking ones, but it doesn't really give us a replacement for concurrency libraries which will be built on top of Loom and on, and on top of these lower level concurrency primitives and it also doesn't give us declarative concurrency which is much better suited and much less error prone to solve concurrent problems. Um, and when talking about concurrency and uh, project loom and futures it's good to have in mind that there's a certain duality in how we can look at the process. So we can view a process as code which is usually written using the blocking style which is, uh, you know, the uh, sequential style, let's say. Or we can look at the process as a value, uh, for, for example, as a future, right? Such a value can be composed, it can be orchestrated. Uh, it's uh, often much easier to, uh, to define the concurrency of our system when dealing with processes represented as, as values. So where Loom shines really is sequential logic, and that's uh, the majority of business code out there, right? Uh, in such code we have procedures, we have step-by-step -step instructions with some maybe conditionals and things like that. 
And here, asynchronous is really a technical detail. It doesn't really uh, matter if it's asynchronous or not. It's nice that it's, and uh, you know, asynchronous is, is, is important because it makes the code fast, but it's not essential to the problem that the code solves. And here, uh, such a process is best represented as code. Uh, with futures, where futures shine is orchestration of concurrently running processes, right? It's uh, probably more niche code, but, but uh, business critical. It's hard to get uh, right. And here, asynchrony is a first-class citizen. Here, we want to leverage uh, quite often the fact that we are dealing with asynchronous uh, computations. And here, also, readability is paramount, but readability means something different than with the sequential code, right? Here, readability means that we can see how these processes are orchestrated, we can see how they communicate, we can see how they are composed, and so on. And here, it very often is useful to represent a process as a value. So that's all I had. Uh, thank you very much. If you would like to explore more on these topics, there's a bunch of links in the description of the video. I think they should be quite uh, informative. Um, again, thank you very much and have a good day.